What's up you guys, welcome to today's video. As you can tell by the title, we're gonna be talking about Minnesota no longer separating mommies and babies when the mother is incarcerated. If you guys are new here, hi, my name is Jess. I'm a person in long-term recovery who had a baby in prison and went through so much trauma surrounding that, and we're gonna get into all of that today. Please smash the subscribe button if you have not done so already. We're almost to 500K, so excited. Um, and if you wanna follow me on any other social media platform, TikTok, Instagram, Patreon, all of that is linked down below, as well as my vlog channel and my podcast and all of that stuff. I'm just too excited to do the intro today, so let's just kick this thing off. <laughs> So Mama Dr. Jones shared my birth story. I'll put it up right here. She blind reacted to me giving birth in prison. And then like two days later or so, we got the news about Minnesota. That's just a happy coincidence. And I am so happy. Let me read the article to you guys. And then we're gonna talk about the unbelievable trauma that I went through. And no woman should ever have to go through what I went through. Let me read this article to you guys. Minnesota will be the first state to stop separating incarcerated moms and newborns. I don't like that title because there are other states with nursery programs like Bedford Hills in New York. I think Indiana has a nursery program, but I'm sure they're gonna mention that. It's hard for Raylene Baker to say which season is harder, the separation when a new mother unwillingly gives her newborn away or the follow-up when she meets with the mother several days later. Often the mom is still lactating, a painful physical reminder of the infant she cannot hold. As a doula who works in Minnesota jails and prisons, Baker regularly deals with these inevitable parts of the job. Let me just pause it here. The pain that I went through while I was lactating, I was not given a pump, I was not given any medication to make the milk go away, I was forced to wrap my engorged breast in ace bandages, and I was in so much pain that there were moments where I would have to scream into a pillow because I don't wanna make a scene because I'm in prison. I, I don't know why I thought that. Girl, make a scene. I mean, I was in so much pain, but I didn't want anyone to be uncomfortable because I was so uncomfortable. Like that's just where my head was. This was embarrassing and dehumanizing and painful. I can't even describe the pain to you guys. It's just really painful, Baker said. I look at the baby who is nursing and know that the next time the baby eats, it won't be from his or her mother. It will be from a bottle held by someone they've never met after they've had these days of snuggling and cuddling. As it stands, women give birth while incarcerated in Minnesota. She is not allowed to keep the baby. After two or three days at the hospital, the baby goes to a new caregiver, a relative if possible, and if not, the baby goes into the state's foster care system, which is exactly what happened in my case. I know this isn't about me, but this really hits close to home because I'm like reliving what I went through. In my, in the state that I gave birth in, it was 24 hours if you had a vaginal delivery and it was 48 hours if you had a C-section. I was just blessed with an extra day somehow. Baker is the director of the Minnesota Prison Doula Project, an organization that sends doulas such as herself to jails and prisons in the state to work with pregnant women who are incarcerated and then also advocates for the rights of those women. Thanks in large part to lobbying and organizing by Baker and her colleagues starting in August, women in Minnesota will no longer experience this. A new law signed by Governor Tim Walz in May will make the state the first in the country to stop separating women in jail and prisons from their newborns. Several other states have programs in which infants may remain with their mothers for various lengths of time, but the United States as a whole is one of only four nations that routinely separate inmate mothers from their newborns. Some argue that these state programs don't take a considered approach to making hard decisions about what's best for their children in challenging family situations. Minnesota's program stipulates that mother and child will be placed in a community-based program for up to a year. The details of what exactly those programs will look like are still being ironed out. It's very exciting that Minnesota is leading in this. The goal of her organization is to end prison births in the United States and she sees this as a meaningful move in the right direction. I think that having the newborns with the parent after birth will do a lot in terms of humanizing the need. Men greatly outnumber women in prison, but more and more women are going to jails and prisons every year. The number of women incarcerated in the United States grew to at a rate of more than twice the men, 750% between 1980 and 2017. In Minnesota, roughly 20 women gave birth while incarcerated annually. <laughs> 20 women a year are going through what I went through, like just in that state alone. 
Nursing for Women's Health and Medical Journal reported that nationally the number is estimated to be around 1,400. The journal also found that between 6 and 10% of women are pregnant when they enter jail or prison. In Baker's experience, most of the women she works with are incarcerated for minor offenses. A lot of times they're in for something so minor like a technical violation on an old, old charge. Maybe they're doing better now and they're healthier and having a baby. Of the 278 pregnant women who were criminally convicted in Minnesota between 2013 and 2020, 77% were for technical violations for their parole or probation, such, a, such as failing a drug test, missing an appointment with their supervising officer and 88% had nonviolent offenses. 88% are in for nonviolent minor petty ass shit. I'm sorry. Like it just infuriates me. We are forcing women to give birth in prison chained to a bed when they literally could be home. Like what's the reason for incarcerating a mother that's about to give birth on a technical parole violation? What is the reason? If you know, please let me know because I have a bachelor's degree in correctional program support services. I served time in prison myself, had a baby in prison myself, and I still can't find the answer. What is the answer? Over half of these women will be released within six months of giving birth. Lawmakers said that they weighed statistics like these when considering the rationale for incarcerating these women and removing their babies. It's the most traumatic, horrific, dehumanizing thing that a woman will ever go through in prison. It's the most gruesome and painful, and it took me years to be even okay. I still have have long lasting issues with this. I have PTSD. I still have night terrors. I still have nightmares. I know that you guys know that I have full custody of my daughter and we're happy and thriving, but we didn't get here overnight. It was a long process, not just for me, but my daughter as well. This is just so uncalled for. They are already very short sentences, but this period of time in a baby's life and mother are critical. There's always that concern that you're being soft on crime, but this is about being soft on babies. It gives them a chance. It gives them a chance to know their mother. I don't care how tough you are, how badass you are. It is not acceptable to remove babies from their mothers at birth. It's disgusting. It's just, there's no words for it. Separation can be damaging to both mother and child, maternal health experts say. For the infant in those early hours, days, and weeks, they are rapidly taking the information and making connections. Being with the person who is going to care for them and who will feed them, that all has an important impact on the neurodevelopment. And for any mother, the days and months after giving birth can be extremely challenging physically and emotionally, regardless of the setting. Mental illness is more prevalent in the population of women behind bars, making them more vulnerable to postpartum depression. Yup. Add another layer, they feel like they are being punished for giving birth, she continued. They are wondering who is taking care of their baby, feeling guilt and shame. Patients I've taken care of and colleagues I've worked for who have given birth in an incarcerated setting, this is something that still haunts them to this day, even decades later. And I can speak for myself when I say that, yes, my daughter's nine. She turns nine on Saturday and it haunts me. It haunts me me. And I felt so much guilt and shame. I didn't talk about this for years. I didn't actually talk about this really with my partner, with Reese or my family. The first time I talked about it was on YouTube. I mean, in therapy and then YouTube. I didn't openly talk about this in my life. It took years to even be able to talk about it. And even four or five months into my YouTube career, I still hadn't filmed that video. So... Advocates in other states are taking note that folks in Minnesota for a long time have been leading the country and thinking about the effects of incarcerated pregnancies. Um, do we, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so every state needs to follow suit. Every state needs to follow suit. Every state. Because you're not just hurting mothers on nonviolent crimes more often than not. Mothers that are only gonna serve a tiny piece of time in jail. You're not just hurting them. You're hurting innocent babies. And I know many of you asked me throughout the years if I was able to have an abortion when I was in prison in Arkansas. The answer is no. In most states, this is the reality. If you come into jail pregnant, you're just pregnant. So you don't get a choice. You don't get a choice. They force you to carry your pregnancy to term. They force you to give birth chain to a bed. And if you have no family, they force the child into the foster care system. And you don't know anything. I didn't know where she was for months. I didn't know if she was okay. I didn't know if she was healthy. I didn't know if she was alive. I didn't know who had her, where she was, nothing. I got pictures of my daughter when she was probably four months old or so, three, four months. And that's all I got, pictures and a tiny little note saying that she was doing okay. So can you imagine the terror that I had to endure for months not knowing where she was or if she was okay? Not to mention, 
the physical pain that I'm going through, the psychological damage that has just been done, that trauma was so unbelievably difficult. In my first few weeks, I would just call my mom and cry. I wouldn't even say anything to her. I would just say, I want my baby, I want my baby, and I would just cry. I would sit on these very expensive phone calls for 20 minutes and just cry because my mom is a familiar voice. It comforted me to hear what she had to say. And it was the only moment that I was okay. It was when I was just literally crying on the phone to my mother. It was gruesome and horrific. Because my daughter went into foster care, I didn't have visitation with her. I had to wait to see her. She was six months old when I first saw her and I saw her in court. The judge allowed me 15 minutes in chambers and that is when I was able to meet my daughter for the first time in chains. I don't want any woman to ever go through what I went through, but I know I'm not the first woman to go through that. And I know, I know since then I was not the last. This is happening all the time. America should be ashamed of themselves for doing this to women and babies. They should be ashamed of themselves. It's barbaric and brutal, but this is good news. This is good news. Minnesota, I am proud of you. I'm watching you closely. I can't wait until this is implemented. Every single state needs to follow. And we need to stop putting people in jail on technical parole violations. I know that New York has made changes to its parole policy and they try not to put you back in prison for failed drug screens or curfew violations. That's a technical violation. Um, technical violations include missing appointments, not finding a job, missing curfew, failing drug screens, things like that are technical violations. So we need to stop putting people in jail for that. We need to, we need to end the war on drugs. That is what keeps our prison population full. And we need to start treating people that suffer from substance use disorder. And no, that's not a term I made up. That's a medical term. Not my term. As a whole, we have a lot of areas that we need to fix in this system. Our prison system is a failure. It's an embarrassment to this country. It's a brutal, dehumanizing experience for so many. So we have a lot of changes to make and it's not gonna happen overnight. But I firmly believe in prison reform and I know that just sharing my story shed so much light on what women go through in prison. I am so grateful for this platform. I'm so grateful that you guys tune in and you listen to my story. And so many of you have told me that you wanna fight for prison reform and that means everything to me. I'm gonna end today's video here. I love you guys. Stay safe, stay sober, whatever that looks like to you. I'm so fucking happy that Minnesota is doing this and I will see you guys in my next one.